Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and it's time for another daily dose of Brothers War Spoilers. So, we've been working our way through the set color by color, and today it is Red Day, and Red has some pretty spicy cards in this set, which means we should probably jump right into it, start talking about the sweet red cards from Brothers War. Before we do, Two quick reminders. Number one, if you want to keep up on all the latest spoilers or see the full Brothers War spoiler, you should head on over to mtgpreviews.com. Number two, if you need some Brothers War cards, you can get them from our awesome sponsor, Card Kingdom, over at cardkingdom.com slash mtggoldfish. And you can get a free goldfish sticker. Just let them know you want one in your order notes, and they'll be happy to hook you up. Anyway, let's talk the red cards from the Brothers War. First up in the world of red cards, we got a pretty interesting uncommon in Arms Race. So form an enchantment that lets you pay for to put an artifact from your hand on the battlefield. It gains haste. You gotta sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. So essentially Arms Race is basically a, a sneak attack for artifacts that cost more mana, or I guess the Perforos Bronze Budded might actually be a even more apt comparison since that can put artifact creatures into play. The twist here though is you can put non-creature artifacts into play so like a phyrexian portal cheating that into play in standard for just four mana kind of sweet or a spine of his shop put it in blow something up bounce it back to hand my guess is it's a little bit too expensive to really be competitive although i think we could build a sweet standard against the odds deck around it and if you're building some artifact deck in perforos or sneaker attack are a little bit too expensive for your budget and commander this could be a nice budget replacement letting you achieve some really big things into play on the cheap the biggest problem is altogether the first artifacts can cost you eight mana four and then four more and then four to cheetah artifact into play why it's certainly a discount compared to paying seven for spine of Isha or nine for portal to phyrexia is still not exactly cheap so my guess is against the odds card in standard but a really fun one and probably a nice budget card for commander decks we also got bitter reunion two mana enchantment when etbs you can discard a card to draw two cards and pay one to sack it to give creatures you control haste until end of turn so this is essentially a enchantment version of tormenting voice if you really think about it it's exactly the same you spend a card plus discard a card to draw two cards the upside is you can give all your creatures haste which is a nice little bonus i think we've seen tormenting voice show up in decks in the past although they're often spell matter decks bitter reunion goes another direction it's more of an enchantment matter style card otherwise you'd probably play an actual tormenting voice or something similar but we played a deck not that long ago at standard that was using like spirit sisters call and right of harmony and cami war to just kind of like churn through your deck and do all these reanimator synergies i think combining bitter reunion with fable the mirror breaker could actually be really sweet in a deck like that so i'm oddly hyped about this enchantment fills the graveyard free animation synergies keeps you churning through your deck and triggers your hollowed haunting or whatever other enchantment payoffs you have so a tormenting voice but with a really sweet enchantment twist we also got brotherhood's end a new red sweeper so three mana sorcery you get to choose one deal three damage to each creature in each planeswalker or destroy all artifacts mana value three or less and this card, I think, is one of the best from the set. So, on level one, it's a twist on normal Red Sweepers. Anger, the God, Sweltering Sun, Slag Storm. We got a ton of these cards that for three mana deal three damage to everything. And each of them gets some upside. Anger, the God's Exiles the Creatures, Sweltering Sun, Cycles, Slag Storm can deal damage to players. The upside of Brotherhood's End is you can blow up all the cheap artifacts on the battlefield. And I think that's a huge upside. So, it's a good sweeper against aggro creatures. More importantly, we're going into a standard where blood tokens are a thing we're going into a standard where treasure tokens are a thing we're going into a standard where power stones are a thing so there's a ton of these artifact tokens that are probably going to be running around i think this also might give brothers to then some relevance in modern where it can sweep away cheap creatures which is going to a lot of matchups and also blow up all the urza saga tokens which is pretty relevant or like wreck affinity and i think this also means if this can be a good sweeper in commander normally you don't see anger of the god style effects or sweltering sun style effects in commander because most creatures are too big for three damage to kill them but i think that brothers to breaks the mold because of that artifact mode when you think about commander decks 
everyone's playing mana rocks they're some of the most popular cards in the format and mana rocks are almost exclusively three or less mana all the signets chromatic lantern soul rings mana crypts so this is gonna blow up all of the mana rocks and it also gives you a safety valve in case someone's going off with treasures which are pretty popular or other artifact based tokens a uh, loan is going off with clues so i think the brothers at end is just a really good card i think standard it's gonna be very important as a sweeper both for creatures and artifacts i think this is the rare red sweeper a uh, cheap red sweeper that can actually break into commander and i wouldn't be surprised to see this maybe undo anger of the gods in a format like modern where i think blowing up urza saga tokens is maybe just more important than exiling creatures that it kills we also got a red mythic aura in draconic destiny and this card i've seen people kind of down on this card thinking it's not very good i actually think this card is really strong and that we're going to see a lot of it in standard so three mana enchant a creature enchant a creature gets plus one plus one and flying and haste and essentially fire breathing pay one to pump it plus one plus zero and it's a dragon most importantly when enchanted creature dies you return to chronic destiny to its owner's hand so i think this card is actually going to be really important to aggro decks in standard sending creatures to the air very very strong so it compares to ranker kind of a more expensive ranker maybe even more directly compares to angelic destiny the white version of this effect and i don't think draconic destiny is quite as good as angelic destiny just giving a static plus four plus four and flying in first strike probably better than plus one plus one flying haste and fire breathing but still we don't have angelic destiny in standard we don't have ranker in standard in this i think can fill that role if you think about what this card is it's essentially an arcane flight with the upside of giving haste mixed with a fire breathing so what i'm envisioning is you're playing a red aggro deck and you're playing your rod of fire brands or squeeze or reckless storm seekers whatever you just throw Dracronic destiny on your creature it gives it flying a little bit of pumping you smash your opponent because they don't have a way to block the flyer if your opponent kills it well you just do it again they spend a removal spell on your relatively tame aggro threat and then if you ever untap with this and you have a window you can just dump four mana five mana into your draconic destiny's fire breathing and hit your opponent for eight damage or something and just close out the game in one massive attack so i think we're going to see this card in red aggro decks in specific be a really scary finisher it's one of those surprise cards where you feel like okay i got this under control i got a bunch of blockers i'm not going to die to all these random red dorks and then the Decronic Destiny comes down and sends something to the air, and you just die on the spot. We also have some aura synergies in standard. I have no idea how we're gonna make the mana work for these decks, but like Light Paws really likes Decronic Destiny. Ivy has some synergies with targeting stuff. Maybe we see the return of Cami of Transients. It's been a while since we've had the Rune Storm deck in standard. They kind of rotated out. We haven't seen a deck like that, but these are all cards that like Decronic Destiny, want you casting auras, want you targeting your creatures with spells. So maybe there's some combination here that could work as well so draconic destiny i think it's a standard only card i don't really expect it to break outside a standard i guess you play in some sort of red auras commander deck which is kind of a new thing we got a bunch of like red aura commanders in what the kamigawa commander precons so maybe you could throw it in there but i think mostly this is a really scary finisher for red aggro decks in standard we also got a card that i threw up here just to complain about and that's the fall of krug one thing I really want, it's Magic's 30th birthday. I want land destruction to return to standard. I just want a decent land destruction spell. Give me a stone, Wayne Watsy. Something like that. It doesn't have to be busted. We don't have to have sinkhole. We don't need wasteland or strip mine. We don't need blood moon, but just something that's like kind of playable. And this is something I've been harping on for a while. So we saw finally our land destruction spell from the Brothers War, and it is about as bad as it gets. It's six mana. You choose an opponent, you blow up one of their lands, and then it deals three damage to that player and one damage to each creature they control. It's six mana it's so far away from being playable so to me this is one of the most disappointing cards i know i shouldn't get my hopes up wizards has made it pretty clear they don't want us blowing up lands in standard but i gotta say you gotta make it a little more competitive than this watsy so fingers crossed maybe phyrexia maybe when we go back to phyrexia maybe that's the set where wizards lets us celebrate 30 years of magic by <laughs> making our opponents not play magic but for now the fall of the krug is another super disappointing land destruction spell on the other hand we got a two drop that is very much not disappointing in felden ronum excavator so two mana two two haste it's a legendary human artificer it can't block so you're going to be swinging with it not playing any defense and then it says when it's dealt damage exile that many cards from the top of your library choose one of them until the end of your next turn you can play that card so if it takes damage you get to cast a card from the top
top your library with a little bit of filtering maybe if it takes a lot of damage so it's a two drop that hopefully eventually replaces itself so when you think about this here's why i'm high on this card i'm high on this card because red is really lacking a good secondary two drop if you look at red aggro decks in standard bloodthirsty adversary that's in pretty much all of them that's kind of a staple beyond that some red aggro decks don't even play a second two drop because they're not that good some of them play rod as firebrand which is like kind of hilariously bad in a mono color deck where you're never really going to do the domain pumping thing so i think that felden just slots in behind bloodthirsty adversary is the next best two drop two two haste is fine yeah not being able to block is a little annoying but you're playing mono red so you're probably going to want to be attacking anyway and then you get a card out of it when it dies maybe it trades off in combat it's going to be unblockable maybe a lot of the time because your opponent's not going to want to give you the card by chump blocking and if it dies to like a flame blast bolt or unleash the inferno uh, that's fine too because it's going to replace itself and the more damage it takes the higher the odds are of you finding the right card you only get to cast one of the cards even though you get to exile a bunch of cards however if you take 10 damage and go 10 cards deep you're probably going to find what you need for that next turn another way to play this that's kind of hilarious but also probably kind of horrible is defiler of instinct defiler when you cast a red permanent you get to ping something for one so in theory you could play both of these cards and use defiler to just ping your felden every turn to draw an extra card um, nice source of card advantage for mono red we haven't really seen the defiler cycle take off yet but maybe that's still coming and commander <clears throat> I don't think this is a very good commander. I think this is a standard card, but if you want to build around it, it does kind of lend itself to a self damage style deck. Uh, Blasphemous Axe, Star of Extinctions, Pyrohemia, either repeatedly pinging it for one damage or hitting it for a ton of damage so you dig super deep in your deck and find the perfect card. Can even make it indestructible, put an equipment on it to make it indestructible. And then you just load up your deck with like stuffy doll effects and kind of play off that. So I don't think it's a really strong commander, but it does kind of push you in a neat direction of stuffy doll and damaging your own creature so fell then another card that i would be surprised if it made it outside of standard and being legendary does limit the number of copies you can play but i think in standard i would not be the least bit surprised to see this card show up a lot in mono red decks maybe not as a four of but like a two or three of and probably be very good there next up we got a random uncommon that i don't think is really getting enough hype for just how good it is and that's giant cinder maw so with three mana four three dinosaur beast it has trample and says players can't gain life you know this is going to be an arena staple <laughs> arena players love their life gain decks and this is a great way to shut them down but i think this card is actually just super far above the curve i was researching this card a little bit and one thing i realized is in the history of magic the only red three mana four three that doesn't have a meaningful drawback is bone crusher guy and we know how good that card is bone crusher giant is just a busted card so incredibly far above the curve so we're already starting off with pretty playable stats a three mana four three trample that's already good and then remember not that long ago rampaging Frozadod, which was a three drop with pretty decent stats that kept players from gaining life it was literally banned in standard it was too good during robin op red standard giant cinder mall kind of calls back to both of these cards two cards that you could argue in the not that distant past were literally the best cards or among the best cards in their standard formats and it's a random little uncommon and if you think about our current standard format there's actually quite a bit of life gain. Most decks are going to have a little bit here or there. Uh, Denik, for example, has lifelink. Workshop, Warchief, Archangel Wrath, Fraction Missionary, Obscure Interceptor. These are all among the like top 25-ish creatures in standard. So you are hating on most decks with an already on-curve trampling creature. And then if you're running the dedicated life gain deck, you just get him with Giant Cinder Moth. So I think that this is probably like red three drop number two behind Reckless Stormseeker. Stormseeker is just so aggro. It's really good. But I'm actually like kind of blown away way it just how strong this card is outside of standard uh, rampaging frozen on probably better because of the damage it deals when creatures enter the battlefield but in standard this is just a very impressive card on rate with a very relevant ability we also got a little common that might shake up modern of all things goblin blast rudder a one mana one two that says as long as you sack to permanent this turn it gets plus two plus zero and has menace so that makes it a three two menacing one drop which is actually very good stats so 
So this could be a card that could show up in Standard. Maybe you play with Oni Cold End. Well, it could show up in Pioneer. Maybe you play in a uh, Cat Oven style Sacrifice deck. I don't know if you want to be that aggro in those decks, but you could, and it would be good. I mean, a one mana three two mana is that's a really powerful effect. The reason to be hyped about this card though is Modern. In Modern, everyone's playing Fetch Lands, and those are permanents that you're sacrificing all the time. So in an aggro Zoo style deck that is built around sacrificing permanents, like a Revolt Zoo style deck, I feel like you're pretty much every turn of the game gonna have this be a 3-2 menace and that's really above the curve yeah it doesn't have haste like goblin guide or monastery swift sphere but still it's like a wild mccoddle or something a very very strong effect so i'm interested in trying out revolt zoo again we got like nam nam renegade hidden herbalist renegade rally or throwing goblin blast rider maybe some ugh, stupid monkeys like ragavan or wild mccoddles and the stage is set for a super aggro deck so i think that goblin blast runner because of its interaction with fetch lands might actually have a chance to show up in aggro decks all the way back to modern we also got horn stone seeker which i mostly wanted to mention because it's a really cheap way to make a power stone so if you're trying to like ramp into the big artifacts which are actually really good with power stones like that's one of the easy ways to ramp into them this could be a pretty powerful two drop so it's a two mana two two with menace when it etbs you make a tap power stone when it leaves the battlefield you sack a power stone but it's a two drop that essentially makes an extra mana yeah that mana is super limited you can only use it on artifact spells or abilities but still if you're trying to ramp into some big artifacts that's pretty much on curve and worst case just sack a power stone who really cares it's not the end of the world so i could see this card showing up in weird ramp decks we also got a new enchantment in mechanized warfare three mana red enchantment is that if a red source or an artifact source you control would deal damage to an opponent or permanent opponent controls it deals that much damage plus one instead so mechanized warfare it's a weird, weird card. So adding a damage to your sources of damage that are red or artifacts, it's a pretty powerful effect. The question is, if you're trying to be aggro, which presumably you are, if you're playing a card like this in a damage-based deck, do you really want to take a turn off to get this on the battlefield? Will it stick on the battlefield? We saw with Riveteer's Ascendancy recently, the enchantments don't stick around that long. So is this card actually going to be worth it? I'm not sure, but it does a lot of powerful things. So it's essentially like... Very close to Jaya, the Uncommon Planeswalker version of Jaya. Also triggers on artifact spells, so a small upgrade, but very similar to that. Could also compare it maybe to Torbrand, only getting one extra damage rather than two. But still, similar effect. We're getting a little bit more damage. As far as where this card goes, my first thought is, playing this in the burn deck we played. We played this burn deck with Thermo Alchemist and Kessive Flame Breather, where you essentially get a damage whenever you cast a non-creature spell. Well, if you have a Mechanized Warfare out, you're getting two damage. You're we're gonna burn your opponent out of the game ridiculously quickly when thermo alchemist is tapping for two or flame breather is triggering for two it is not going to take long to kill your opponent especially when you're throwing some burn spells like play with fire becomes a literal lightning bolt with the upside is crying lightning strike deals four damage for two mana so all your burn spells become supercharged as well so is it worth it to play this kind of clunky card where you got to take a turn off that is the question but there's no doubt in my mind that if you do actually get this on the battlefield and burn it's going to be super powerful other places this could work in standard like we talked about defiler of instinct pinging some of our own cards well if we want to ping our opponent with defiler hitting for two instead of one seems pretty nice plus mechanized warfare it's a red permanent so it's going to trigger defiler when you cast it also make sure oni called anvil hit for two a turn rather than one a turn so it speeds up your clock even though the anvil deck it's pretty happy being grindy so i don't know if you really care about speeding up your clock that much but those are other possibilities once you get back to historic or pioneer or modern it works incredibly well with cavalcade calamity similar to torbrad where you just play a bunch of dorks that have one or less power and then you swing with them and then they're all hitting for two if you have mechanized warfare with the calamity and their combat damage and in commander works well with like perforos that's probably the best home for this every creature et being gonna hit your opponent for three that's a really fast clock to burn out the table or impact drivers so i think there's possibilities of this card three mana is not a lot i'm just a little skeptical in standard of sticking enchantments ever since we played that riveteer's ascendancy deck and just could not keep it on the battlefield i'm a little skeptical of enchantments that got us it out for a few turns to do their job but if this does sit out for a few turns it's probably gonna win you the game in the right deck we also got our red command mishra's command and this is an interesting command it's an x spell command so one red and x for a sorcery you get to choose two of target player discards up to x cards and then they draw a card for each card discarded this way this spell deals x damage target creature or x damage target planeswalk 
attacker or target creature gets plus x plus zero and gains haste until end of turn so mishra's command takes the flexibility of commands to the next level not only are commands flexible because you got a whole bunch of different modes to choose from this one is even more flexible because it's an x spell you can cast this from anything from one mana up to a hundred mana and get value out of it if you think about what these modes actually do the first one there's not a direct comparison it's kind of like the red version of read the runes almost that's as close as i could get for the comparison essentially an x spell looting effect so you cast it for five mana you're gonna draw four after discarding four the nice thing about it is you do have control over it because you are incentivized with mishra's command to have the x for damage or the x for pumping your creature be as high as possible and you might not want to discard every card in your hand but because it says up to x cards you can just discard the bad ones and draw new ones and keep the good ones in your hand so you don't have to loot away any of the cards that you don't want to loot away and that's another upside that's another form of flexibility the second modes kind of like a red sun zenith uh, hitting creatures or planeswalkers and then enrage is probably the closest comparison for the third mode it is worth pointing out read the runes and enrage are both instants mishra's command again is a sorcery like all these commands which i think is a big mark against them however even as a sorcery i think that mishra's command has some value like you can cast this for one mana and kind of get an escape velocity where you just haste in a creature the other modes aren't going to do anything but that's fine so there's going to be situations where you literally cast this with x equals zero and then you're going to be able to hopefully get a lot of value out of this card i think the most common way to play this card is going to be to kill something and then choose the rummaging mode where you discard a bunch of cards to draw a bunch of cards or maybe you're trying to close out the game you can switch into enrage mode and kill a blocker and like pump a creature and hopefully hit your opponent for lethal so i think there are uses for this card as a sorcery i don't think it's a staple but i do think it might have enough flexibility to see play as far as actual synergies works well with hinata because you can target multiple things get a discount on the x works interestingly with feather feather likes to have your things be targeted by spells you can target your creature with the gains haste mode and pumps mode but then also get one of the other modes and still have feather trigger to get it back to your hand so it's kind of a expensive but repeatable removal spell or rummaging spell if you're always choosing the target creature gets plus x plus zero in haste mode is one of your two options the other places could be really spicy is in maybe like pioneer heroic we've seen some decks with like illuminator virtuoso favorite hoplite 10th district legionnaire where you really just want to target your own creatures and this is for two mana a spell that can target two creatures you can pump one of your creatures and then choose to deal damage to one of your creatures uh, trusting the damage isn't going to kill the creature but that's going to trigger your virtuoso or your favorite hoplite any of your heroic or pseudo heroic things so i could see this showing up there as well and if you draw too many lands or whatever you can use it to filter it away so mishra's command this might be the command i'm highest on that we've talked about so far we're four commands deep we haven't talked about the green one yet that'll be in the next video but we're four commands deep i think think that Mishra's Command would be my pick for the most playable of the bunch. Again, I don't think it's broken, best card in standard. I don't even know if it's going to be like a four of anywhere, but the amount of flexibility it offers of improving your hand, killing stuff, pumping your creatures, and its X cost, I think is enough to hopefully have it see play somewhere. We also got one of the most busted reprints in the set. Monastery Swift Spear returns to standard. Literally one of the best one drops in the history of Magic. I think this random little uncommon is on the short list. You got Goblin Guide, you got Ragavans, you got Dragon Rage Channelers. Monastery Swift Spear is up there. If you look at like Modern Burn, this is one of the three creatures in the deck. Swift Spear, Goblin Guide, Eidolon of the Great Rebels. That's Modern Burn. That's how strong this is. So just a one mana, one, two with haste and prowess. So good for aggro decks. And I expect we're going to see this be so good in standard also the first time that we've seen this come to arena which is actually kind of big news we've had it in pioneer but not an arena so not an historic not an explorer in standard really good for the burn style deck that we were talking about also maybe even better in some sort of prowess deck we got like belmore we're getting a new young pyromancer in third path iconoclast we got electrostatic infantry throw in delver if you want to the pieces are there to make some really scary monastery swift spear young pyromancer almost modern style prowess deck with Belmore leading the way and then once you get back to older arena formats like historic you got even more options uh, you got like lightning helix more burn spells if you want to play burn you can also play almost straight up pioneer burn in explorer now uh, with Shandra to kill alongside monastery swift spear so I think monastery swift spear 
it's a big deal. It's just one of the best one drops that has ever been printed in red. I would be shocked if it wasn't hugely impactful and standard. And I think you're gonna see it a lot on Magic Arena as well, where it's brand new. Next up, we got a uncommon removal spell in Obliterating Bolt. So two mana, four damage to a creature Planeswalker. If the creature Planeswalker would die, exile it instead. This is a really solid removal spell. It's essentially an upgraded Thundering Rebuke. Thundering Rebuke saw a decent amount of play not that long ago. Obliterating Bolt does that, but also Exiles, which is a huge deal. This is a card for red decks in standard to deal with Forna Toughness creatures, stuff like Adeline or Rafine that are otherwise pretty tricky for those decks to kill. Plus, the Exile mode is kinda huge. We see a lot of the Death Trigger Dragons, Ao and Itsushi showing up in standard. Being able to exile them with your red deck for just two mana means your opponent's not getting the death trigger. Being able to get rid of a tenacious underdog forever by exiling it is also a huge swing. So Obliterating Bolt, it's one of those cards that how much play it sees is going to depend on the meta. What does the meta look like? How important is killing four toughness creatures? Can you get away with a cheaper removal spell? How important is exiling? Those are the questions, but I have no doubt that this card's going to see play. Whether or not it's a main deck card or a sideboard card that you bring in to kill certain things, we'll have to wait and see. In a like, super aggro red deck, being able to hit your opponent is a big upside. We also have a braid in the format. It seems like killing artifacts might be important. So there is competition here, but there's no way this card does not serve a role in standard. And I I think it's gonna show up main or sideboard in a lot of red decks we also got a random little artifact in mishra's research desk a one mana artifact that lets you pay one tap and sag it to exile the top two cards of your library you get to choose one until the end of your next turn you can play it and then you can unearth it and repeat the whole process for two mana so mishra's research desk i don't think this card's great but i think this card could have a role in standard it could be a backup experimental synthesizer in the oni call anvil decks i don't think it's as good as synthesizer but it's a backup source of card advantage if you you just want to grind through your decks if you care about artifacts being sacrificed this is a cheap way to get it done and the unearth lets you do it twice so in the late game when you run out of artifacts to fuel your anvil this is a way you can get it back and start the process over again the other place i'm curious about this card is modern it's probably not good enough for modern but it is only one mana which is nice that means you can get it with your urza saga and we do have a lot of decks that just care about cheap artifacts you got emery decks you got urza decks you got lantern control style decks anytime you see a one mana card that can be tutored up by urza saga you gotta take notice of it because a deck might want it as like a one-off maybe this is your card advantage slot that you play as your urza saga tutor target so i don't know if it's actually gonna make it but it's worth keeping in mind at least just because of the urza saga synergy we also got one of my personal favorite cards from the set i don't know if this card's good but i cannot wait to resolve this card over the top so seven mana red sorcery says each player reveals a number of cards from the top of their library equal to the number of non-land permanents they control they put all the permanent cards they reveal this way onto the battlefield and put the rest into their graveyard so this reminds me of like a fixed warp world or a fixed great aurora a little bit of genesis wave group hug style thrown in uh, if you've ever seen the warp world or great aurora decks those decks Part of what they do is exactly what Over the Top does. They give you a ton of permanents based on the number of permanents you have on the battlefield. And the trick to breaking the symmetry is just having a bunch of permanents. You get more permanents than your opponent, you're probably going to come out ahead. The thing that they do, though, that Over the Top doesn't do is they care about land. So they can end up mana screwing your opponent by making your opponent shuffle all your lands in. Over the Top doesn't take anything off the battlefield, and it doesn't care about lands at all. It's just adding to the battlefield. So I don't think it's as good as Warp World or Great Aurora, but the way you break the symmetry is the same. You just want to play as many non-land permanents as possible. If you can get 20 non-land permanents on the battlefield and your opponent only has a couple, you're going to get way more value out of this, even though it's technically symmetrical. So that's the easiest way to break it. You also break it just by how you construct your deck. You have a lot of permanents. Your opponent theoretically has more spells than you. So that's another way you can break the symmetry. So in standard, one way to go about this is just trying to put a bunch of tokens on the battlefield. It's going to work best with permanents that make tokens. 
like rabble rousing or resolute reinforcements all those stuff like burn down the house join the dance are ways you can get a bunch of permanents on the battlefield a bunch of tokens only problem is they're not going to come into play from over the top so keep that in mind as you're choosing what to put into play maybe the best way to take advantage of this though is some of the cheap artifact tokens that we can make in standard cards like blood tithe harvester fable the mirror breaker horn stone seeker they are incredibly good with over the top because they're technically each putting two non-land permanents on the battlefield blood tithe harvester itself in a blood token fable itself and eventually a treasure token horn stone seeker itself in a power stone so these are all two permanents for the price of one card which is a great way to break the symmetry of over the top and then you just play a bunch of finishers and trust that when you spin this and raise out you're gonna hit your big stuff and just take over the game sure your opponent's gonna get something too but you're gonna get more stuff and hopefully better stuff another thing i'm interested in we were just talking about all these blood tithe harvesters and hornstone seekers and fable the mirror breaker these are also some of the cards that work best with chaotic transformation so i don't know maybe there's some against the odds deck we can play where we're chaotic transformationing along with over the topping some sort of a weird mono red multiple permanence chaos style deck in standard will the deck be good eh, it might not but it seems like it would be incredibly fun to play so over the top seems really fun for standard once you get to modern or whatever just warp world people the other place it could be interesting is like in treasure decks and commander i know it's a little group huggy your opponents are getting stuff too but if you can make a ton of treasures with agnes or magda or dioxide extortion is all by itself you can easily be putting a huge chunk of your deck onto the battlefield and if your opponent's not playing those cards they're gonna get many fewer cards than you are so you're probably gonna win from the value it generates so over the top it's chaotic it's weird it's got a big deck building restriction it's certainly not as devastating as warp world but for a standard legal card it looks like so much fun to build around we also got sardian cliff stomper which is a pretty interesting uncommon so it's a two mana zero four so lots of toughness not much power it's a minotaur barbarian it says as long as it's your turn and you control four more mountains it gets plus x plus zero where x is the number of mountains you control so this is a two drop that can be very above the curve i mean once you turn it on let's say you play four mountains it's a two mana four four that's pretty good even by 2022 power creep standards the problem is it's a two drop that is not really going to do anything in the early game and if you think about red decks in red aggro decks they're usually trying to kill the opponent quickly so i'm actually a little skeptical that this card's gonna make it i think it's probably gonna be too slow but the amount of power and toughness it can add to the battlefield once you get enough mountains to turn it on is really impressive for a two drop so i think it's worth keeping in mind if you can find a deck that doesn't really need it to be turned on early it is one of the best standard two drops that we have access to in standard we also got tyrant of cure ridges a six mana four five dragon with flying when it etbs and deals four damage any target and then you can pay one to give it plus one plus zero and down to turn so fire breathing Ha! Huh, how far we have come in the last 30 years poor shivan dragon the og shivan dragon it's so much worse now we're getting shivan dragons almost i guess you're getting one less power but with an etb deal for damage and if you read like some of the spoiler posts of this card most people think it's bad most people are like oh yeah probably good in limited seems like a limited bomb but it's not even exciting anymore so even this super power crab souped up shivan dragon is still not enough to get people hyped into 2022 so this is a six mana flame tongue kavu with the upside that it can deal damage to any target so we can throw damage at your opponent's face and i actually kind of like this card i want to build a big burn deck i'm kind of addicted to archangel of wrath which i think is still one of the sleeperiest most powerful cards in standard that just doesn't get its credit it's so so good i have closed out so many games of just grinding 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 and eventually kicking archangel of wrath to burn the opponent out now we can play some sort of mardu deck that you can kick archangel of wrath for six mana it's gonna deal four damage to stuff you can hard cast tyrant of care riches which when an atb steals four damage for six mana that's a lot of direct damage attached to pretty decent bodies so i want to build some sort of mardu mid-range archangel tyrant burn style deck how good it'll be i'm not sure but it seems like it could have potential no one expects your mardu mid-range deck to just burn your opponent's face directly and now we have multiple cards that can do that so tyrant of care ridges definitely one of the best shivan dragons we've ever seen and i'm not convinced that it's that bad in standard even though everyone else seems down on it we also got a little two drop in scrap work mud a two mana two one it's a dog when it etbs you can discard a card and draw a card you can unearth it for two this one's worth mentioning just because we've seen some of the 
Hades rummaging, looting two drop C play in the past. If you really want to fill your graveyard, get a reanimation target in there, maybe an unearth target in there. It gets the job done. It's kind of like Professor of Symbology, Rick's Mahdi Reveler. Uh, maybe not quite as good as those, which have more upside, but the upside of Scrap Pokemon is you also can unearth it. So you can technically do it twice if it dies. So I don't think it's impossible that there's some deck that just cares about filling the graveyard that might want to play this in the two drop slot. Its stats aren't great, but unearth really helps. And it does do a good job of filling the graveyard. We also got our red mythic prototype creature, Skitter Beam Battalion. So nine mana four, four, it's a construct with Trample and Haste. When it ETBs, if you cast it, you make two tokens that are copies of it. So for nine mana, you get three, four, four Trample Haste. You can also prototype it for five mana and get two, two. So for five mana, you get three, two, two Trample Haste. This is a very interesting card to me. I think the nine mana mode is really scary. Like if you can get to that, that is a great way to close out games. The five mana mode, I'm not sure if that's good enough in most decks. I know it's technically adding six Trample Haste power and it's, in some ways good that it's split up with three and three bodies that means one removal spell is not going to deal with it on the other hand by the time you're casting this on turn six our two two is going to be impressive enough like or are they all just going to get blocked by random stuff your opponent has on their side of the battlefield if you think about the prototype mode we have a few different cards that are kind of similar that for six mana or five mana make three two two tokens with some sort of upside none of them have haste which is kind of a big deal and five mana is a pretty good price we don't really have a five mana version so i think that skitter beam battalion prototype mode is better than a sure assemble from underneath the floorboards imperial oath which is good because none of those cards really saw much play to see a play it needs to be better than that as i mentioned before the part of this card that really scares me is nine mana make three uvenwald oddities essentially they all come down with ac probably win the game on the spot that's a pretty nice discount three uvenwald oddities probably like 12 mana if you're getting it for nine mana that's a nice little bonus however the question is how often can you get to nine mana how are you getting there nine mana is a ton of mana even though this is a great finisher if you get there can we get there i think one possibility is maybe this is the payoff for the power stone deck i can't believe i'm saying that but maybe your horn stone seekering and visions of phyrexiaing and transpidering and sarnith great worming and just trying to make a bunch of power stones with everything that you play and then this could be coming down what turn five or something for full price and essentially just winning the game if you can just power stone power stone power stone cheat this out using the power stone mana it's just gonna smash people to death and i think we got the pieces for it not only power stones but we just played that uh, ramp deck not that long ago with topiary stompers and weather seed treaties this could show up there as well because remember the nine mana mode is colorless it's not like we even need red mana you probably want it in case you do want to prototype it but it's not a necessity so i think that's how you play the card if the prototype mode is going to be good it's probably going to be because of artifact synergies the other way to look at that mode and this card in general is it's putting three artifacts on the battlefield for the cost of one card so maybe you're a dragon spark reactor deck and whenever an artifact comes into play you get counters trying to burn your opponent out for five mana this is making three two twos which is already good and it's adding three counters to dragon spark reactor or maybe you're playing teething wormland and trying to go off with that and put counters on it and gain life and give it death touch skitter beam battalion is great there too it's three artifacts for the price of one so keep an eye out for more synergies these are the two biggest synergies for like artifacts entering the battlefield at the moment but if we get some more like how many artifacts do you have artifacts entering the battlefield do something cool then this goes up even more in value because even though the two twos i'm not convinced are going to get through all the shieldreds and graveyard trespassers of the world if they're doing other things as well they get much much better of course in older formats or commander i mean it's sweet with panharmonica and you're going to double up the tokens that you make it's sweet with doubling seasons anointed processions so keep those synergies in mind uh, you could make a lot of tokens if you have one of these cards on the battlefield so skitter b battalion i really want to cast it for nine mana not for five mana this is one where the prototype doesn't feel that good for me on the other hand i feel like this could be a really nice ramp finisher if you can build your deck to consistently be able to cast it for full price whether that be with power stones or other sources of ramp we also got visions of phyrexia four mana enchantment says at the beginning of your upkeep exile the top card of your library you may play that card this turn and the beginning of your end step if you didn't play a card from exile this turn create a tap power stone token so this card 
comes down on the first turn that you played it you're presumably getting a power stone because it doesn't exile a card until your next upkeep so unless you get another way to cast cards from exile this is come down make a power stone and then it essentially turns into an outpost siege or an upgrade advances blasting cannons this is the best version it says play rather than cast so you do get to play lands with it as well which is really what you want out of these effects but a four mana enchantment that is impulse drawing you an extra card each turn you get an extra card but you got to use it this turn still a little scared how long this will sit on the battlefield but we've seen in the past without both sieges and even vats's blancing cannons that these cards can be pretty good sources of card advantage you bring them in you get them on the battlefield you're drawing two cards a turn your opponent's only drawing one card a turn and if you do hit a useless card and can't use it you get a power stone which can help you ramp into bigger things so i think that visions of phyrexia might actually be pretty relevant i think this could be if not a main deck card at least a good sideboard card if you're playing an aggro deck or some sort of aggressive mid-range deck one of the slots in your sideboard that you often want is a card that's going to come in against control decks and help you keep up with cards you're assuming your opponent is going to be able to kill and counter most of your stuff so you need a way to keep the action flowing to keep up with your controlling opponent's card advantage visions of phyrexia seems like a really nice way to do it you just sneak it in and start drawing extra cards every turn to help fight through the control decks so even if it doesn't make it in the main deck i could see burn decks aggro decks uh, maybe the thundering raju gruel style decks playing this out of the sideboard also obligatory good in prosper i know everything's good in prosper these days but it is another card that lets you cast cards from exile probably not going to be getting power stones all that often but prosper doesn't really care about that it just wants to get cards in exile to make treasures and if somehow you don't have your synergies going with prosper then you get a power stone as a bonus so i think this is a pretty easy easy inclusion in prosper commander or historic brawl deck so visions of fraxia i like it so those are the red cards from barther's war which means it is time to wrap up today's video with the top three cards for standard for pioneer and modern and for commander starting with standard number three felden ronim excavator we talked about it before red is lacking good two drops and i think even though this card isn't insane it's a very playable two drop and i think it's gonna find its way into red aggro decks almost by default because there's just not a lot of competition for that slot number two draconic destiny people are sleeping on this card i am legit scared that this card is gonna come down out of aggro decks mono red gruel decks like that sending a big threat to the air and just smashing me to death in a turn or two and even if i manage to kill the creature it's gonna keep coming back ranker style so even though it might not look that impressive at first glance i think we're gonna die a lot to this card in standard and then number one monastery swift spear when you put one of the best creatures of its type of all time into standard you gotta take notice i expect the prowess decks benefit a ton from this the belmore decks and just mono red aggro style decks should get a huge huge boost of power from swift spear coming back to standard for the first time in a long time moving on to modern and pioneer and i gotta say oh this was tough i'm not seeing a ton that i'm super convinced out of the red cards in brothers war is gonna see play in pioneer and modern so number three we got the dark horse long shot mishra's research desk my argument is it works with urza saga so maybe it's a one of to draw cards in an urza saga deck but in all honesty i was really struggling to fill slot number three with a card that i think can actually see play in modern or pioneer number two goblin blast runner really good with badges i don't think it'll show up in pioneer but in modern the fact that it can consistently be a three two menace for a single mana all for just cracking a fetch land which you're probably doing anyway makes me pretty excited about this in aggro and zoo style decks and then number one brotherhood's end i think this might be the new best anger of the gods for modern because not only does it sweep away the cheap creatures just like anger of the gods but the mode of blowing up all artifacts is relevant against decks like affinity other artifact decks and really good against urza saga which is one of the most powerful cards in the format blowing up all the urza saga constructs seems like a really really huge deal moving on to commander number three and this is probably my personal biases but over the top just seems like so much fun to play i love warp world style decks yeah i'm not gonna be able to mana screw my opponents and get rid of all their lands but still the way you build around this seems really interesting and it seems really really powerful if you're willing to put in the work during deck build you just put a ton of permanents into play 
Number two, Brotherhood's End again. The reason I hype for it in Commander is it's an okay way to deal with cheap creatures. More importantly, blowing up all artifacts, mana value three or less, seems really powerful. Getting rid of all people's mana rocks, clue tokens, treasure tokens, power stones, I guess maybe. And then number one, Visions of Fraxia because eh, it's good and prosper, just like every other card. Anyway, that brings us to the end of our Daily Brothers War spoilers for today. That's all the red cards. Let me know what you think. You've seen my picks for the best red cards of the set, and we talked about all of them. What did I miss? What do you hype for? What else could show up in Modern or Pioneer? Is there a better number three card than uh, this silly Mishra's research desk? Am I missing something? Is this just not a very strong Modern or Pioneer set so far? Let me know what you think in the comments. Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll be back tomorrow with more Brothers War set review spoilers. So until then, have a spectacular day, and I will talk to you soon.